It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Edward P. Morgan and Winston Burdett, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Warren Lee Pearson, Chairman of the United States Council, International Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Pearson, it hardly goes, it actually goes without saying that in addition to your present post, you were also chairman of the board of Transworld Airlines and an ex-president of the Export-Import Bank, which makes you ipso facto, whether you like it or not, an expert on finance and world trade. Now, these two things are matters that trouble and puzzle people, I think, and most of us are wondering if our government's grants to foreign countries may not be unnecessarily subsidizing uh, trade abroad, spending too much money. As a matter of fact, Mr. Humphrey, the Secretary of the Treasury, just has made a speech in which one, from which one infers uh, that the government policy on money abroad, except for military expenditures, is going to be very carefully looked at. What are your comments on that general subject, Mr. Pearson? Well, Mr. Morgan, I think what uh, Secretary Humphrey uh, had in mind was that uh, the um, so-called giveaway program, or at least uh, the rather abundant foreign aid which we've been giving to the world the last uh, five years, is coming to an end. I think he was uh, pointing out what's uh, pretty common knowledge now, I think, to all of our citizens. Well, both the Europeans and ourselves are agreed now that it's trade and not aid that is the problem. Well, yes, I don't uh, like those cliches, but I think uh, what they really mean is they'd like to do business and uh, and uh, so far as possible, forget about this foreign economic aid. Well, Mr. Pearson, I think it would be helpful if you would spin out for us in a few words uh, what your own philosophy is about world trade. Should it be a high level, a low level? Uh, should we be isolationist and uh, tend to our own knitting, or just what? Well, I feel this way. Uh, ever since uh, the end of uh, World War II, uh, I think our business people, our exporters, have been living in a, a fool's paradise. They have had, uh, they've had trade at a high level. They can only continue that trade at a high level if we're prepared, if we, the people of the United States, are prepared to keep on our foreign aid programs. Otherwise, we must do one of two things. We must uh, let, the, uh, let our imports uh, drop, and that means our exports will drop, or we have to keep up uh, what we've been doing before and uh, let the taxpayer carry the burden. My, my hope would be that we'll find uh, some means of maintaining high export trade, and the only way we can do that without uh, costing the taxpayer a lot of money is to take some foreign goods. It's my thesis that what we want to do is to get rid of our, uh, what I would call our uh, historic protectionist policy and uh, make it a national policy to liberalize uh, trade, to accept more goods. Well, uh, Mr. Pearson, Chancellor Adenauer of Germany has been one of the most ardent and consistent European champions of free trade and uh, lower tariff po policy, and uh, Adenauer has just been triumphantly re-elected. What effect do you think his re-election will have on the trade picture in Europe? Well, I think it's going to have a very beneficial effect. I think that uh, that Adenauer's uh, election marks uh, a great turning point in European history. For the last year or so, there's been uh, a very apathetic attitude in Europe, if I may put it that way. Uh, the uh, question of defense is, uh, our European friends have been dragging their feet on that. After Stalin's death and uh, Malenkov started his so-called peace offensive, that, uh, that apathy was accentuated. I regard uh, Chancellor Adenauer's election as a great, uh, as a great change. I think that uh, it may be uh, recognized in the future as the beginning of what I would call the uh, economic unification of Europe. Well, Mr. Pearson, in this struggle that we're involved in with the East, 
Is it correct to say that, for the purposes of our particular discussion now about trade, that we have two objectives? First, our own economic solvency in this country, without which we won't be able to do anything. And second, the economic solvency of Europe, uh, which many people say can only be achieved by European unity. And is, is it true, are those two, two things true? And is it all, does it also follow that Mr. Adenauer's election is going to hasten European unity, in your opinion? Well, I think it's going to hasten it. One, uh, one very uh, interesting uh, uh, sidelight of this whole matter is that about three days after uh, Chancellor Adenauer's election, we find uh, our French friends, Premier Laniel and uh, George Bidot, the foreign minister, meeting with their cabinet, and it's uh, common knowledge that what they're discussing is uh, the European defense community and the possible unification of Europe. I think it's a, I think it's a good sign. Well, Mr. Pearson, just exactly how does European unity fit into the trade picture and how is it going to promote freer trade in Europe and a healthier Europe? Well, you, uh, you just have to remember that you have all these small, highly industrial countries contiguous to each other. They're uh, cursed by boundaries and customs between all these boundaries. It's very difficult for one to do business with the other. The uh, industries of one country are dependent largely upon the customers of that country, whereas with uh, real, the real economic integration of Europe, they would have uh, at their uh, disposal a market of around 200 million people, which uh, really is more than we have in the United States. It would give them a chance to have mass production, something they don't have now. Mr. Pearson, it's often most valuable for us to learn and know what other people are saying about us, whether it's beneficial or whether it isn't. Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Adlai Stevenson, who has just come back from a world tour, made a remark in a nationwide speech that he feared we might be returning to economic nationalism. There has been a lot of criticism in Europe that we were returning to protectionist policies, and I know that you and your capacity with the International Chamber of Commerce have recently returned from a meeting in Vienna. What was the atmosphere in Vienna? Were we criticized, uh, and, and what were the criticisms? Well, the attitude of our European friends towards uh, the United States is that, uh, in their opinion, we lack uh, a definitive policy. They say that we, we blow hot and cold on uh, what we're going to do. They were very much disturbed about some hearings we had in Congress, which had to do with the um, renewal of reciprocal trade agreements program. They took all the things that were said in the press by the opponents to the uh, continuation of the reciprocal trade agreements program as though it were the actual feelings of the American people. I think they were unnecessarily disturbed, although you know and I know that uh, the uh, Congress of the United States is at the moment uh, far from being unanimous towards liberalizing our trade policies. As a matter of fact, I think Congress is uh, leans to the side of protectionism at the moment. Well, sir, the Europeans are asking continually for assurances of a new and liberalized foreign economic policy by us. Uh, where do we stand at the moment? What is being done about it? Well, you know that the uh, president has taken a quite a firm stand towards liberaliza liberalization of the United States trade. He has, uh, in very recent weeks, uh, signed the bill which set up the Commission on Foreign Economic uh, Policy, which is being he uh, headed by uh, Mr. Clarence Randall of Chicago. The purpose of that commission is to give a thorough, full-dress study to this question of American trade policy. The terms of reference given by Congress are exceedingly broad. If the commission can uh, answer half the questions that Congress has as asked in the act, it'll be doing very well. Well, right along that line, Mr. Pearson, uh, Mr. Lewis Douglas, our former ambassador to Great Britain, uh, has recently given a report at the president's request, specifically in relation to our trade with Great Britain, and he's emphasized that unless we liberalize our trade policies, we're going to be in for trouble. And uh, as I understand it, that report has been turned over to Mr. Randall's committee for further study. What are your views on, very briefly on that, sir? Well, I think that uh, Mr. Douglas is... Uh has, uh, in his uh, report to President Eisenhower, uh, found what a lot of us who've given some thought to the matter uh, 
have also found, and that is that it, it would be to our best interest and that uh, the best interest of the European countries if we could, uh, as a national policy, mind you, uh, open our markets. It would be, uh, I think, not a, not a selfish policy at all. I think we would, uh, we would benefit by it. Well, now, as a last question, Mr. Pearson, and tying into these other things that we've been talking about, uh, you have just said that, uh, in your estimation, uh, Congress had a protectionist lean. Uh, but you've also said that world trade is, is very important to us. What do you think are the prospects of that policy being followed by the next Congress? Well, I think it's going to have a lot to do with what uh, Mr. Randall's committee can accomplish. And I'd like to put in just one last word on that general subject, and that is we must remember that it was a disunity of Europe that brought the Russians into the scene and put them in position to disturb Europe. We must remember, too, that if ourselves in Europe can together work out uh, our trade policies, we will, doing, we will be doing the best thing we can to protect ourselves from that particular menace. Thank you very much, Mr. Pearson. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Edward P. Morgan and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Warren Lee Pearson, Chairman of the United States Council, International Chamber of Commerce. If you're contemplating the purchase of a very fine watch, it would be profitable to compare the facts about Longines watches with the facts you have about any other timepiece. And you'll find that the facts about Longines are convincing proof of surpassing quality. Factual evidence that in a Longines watch, you have one of the world's very finest timepieces. Now in competition with the world's best watches, Longines watches alone have won for elegance and excellence, 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. For accuracy, highest honors from the leading government observatories. For dependability, a position of leadership in sports, in aviation, and in science. Yet, though Longines is one of the very finest watches made anywhere in all the world, a Longines watch is not excessively expensive. For you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty, And this is important. Whatever the price may be, every Longines watch is manufactured to the high standards of quality which have made Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Starts this Saturday, the Mirror Theater on the CBS Television Network. <laughs>